This morning, I want to talk with you about your doubts. Now, some of you immediately begin thinking about things you doubt, people you find it hard to believe, ideas, scriptures, understandings of God that you find hard to believe. Um, that is something that is a normal part of growing as a Christian. Um, I remember being 18 years old and for the first time in my life, finding myself questioning things I'd been taught and my first thought was one of terror because I thought that because I've got questions and I don't have answers and nobody seems to want to talk about it, I thought I was losing my faith. But the exact opposite turned out to be true. Because the truth is, um, many times struggling with doubt uh, wrestling with our current understanding of how things work and how God works is the very thing. It's, it's sometimes even the Spirit of God letting you know that it's time for you to do some growing, time for you to do some seeking. And when you seek, Jesus promise you find. I'm saying sometimes doubt, the thing that some of us are so embarrassed about we wouldn't tell anybody, is the very thing that can propel you into a much deeper, much authentic, much more authentic faith. And so I want to uh, take you to three different gospel accounts of the resurrection. And the way I want you to notice, pay attention to how the very first followers of Jesus reacted, how, how they responded when they encountered Jesus after his resurrection. Because some of these stories are confusing. They're beautifully confusing and, and yet they demonstrate that something fresh and new had happened that nobody was really expecting, even though he predicted it. I mean, it's just like Jesus predicted for you and me, in this world you will have tribulation, but we really don't expect that will be us. And so when it happens, we're, we're all baffled and rattled and how can this be happening to me? Well, that's, that's just part of the way it goes. Jesus had told them what was going to happen, but they didn't really believe any of it beforehand and they really struggled after. They didn't really believe that he was going to die. Something like that couldn't possibly happen. That would just be too bad. Didn't really believe he was going to die. Didn't want to hear about that. Didn't want to think about that. And once he rose, they really struggled to take that in. It was so radical to them. It was so unexpected that it took their minds some time to adjust. I want you to just look with me at, at two or three scriptures to give you a fresh taste of some verses you've read before, but pay attention to how strange some of this may have sounded to you. If you were one of his original followers, you saw him die. It was such an ugly sight, you couldn't stand to stay there. Everybody but his mother Mary and a couple of women had to leave the execution site. It was just too overwhelming. And then when Jesus began making appearances after his resurrection, he, he, he said some really, uh, what's the word? Uh, he said things that you just wouldn't expect. For example, 
One of the first groups of people he appeared to, the disciples, uh, his question was, um, do you have anything to eat? I'm hungry. Luke 24, verse 40, 41 and 42. Still they stood there in disbelief and wonder. You see, there was a combination. There was both disbelief. Not, not the kind of disbelief that says, I refuse to accept this. We're not talking about a bunch of atheists here. We're talking about his followers, but they're seeing something so big and so surprising. They stood there in disbelief, but at the same time, filled with joy and wonder. Did you know those things could all exist in one sentence? Disbelief, joy, and wonder, all in the same person. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a fish, a piece of broiled fish, which of course you relate to because when you died and you've been dead for two or three days and you rise from the dead, you know, you've worked up a really big appetite and so naturally you're gonna want something to eat. <sighs> but is that what other people are expecting from you? John chapter 20, verse 14 and we're also going to read part of verse 17 this is mary magdalene in the garden seeing him for the first time she turned to leave and saw someone standing there it was jesus but she did not recognize him verse 17 and jesus when she did recognize him, it's like it took her eyes a few seconds to, to take this in, grabbed him. Don't cling to me. Don't cling to me. And of course, if, if, if you're like me and, and you know how it is when you've just been resurrected and the, your best friends don't immediately recognize it. Isn't that just the most frustrating thing? Don't you hate it when that happens? That's what happened. Uh, this was a, a messy process as people who had lost all their faith in him suddenly started seeing these things so wonderful that it was almost too much to take in. And Jesus has always been and still is so filled with wonders and surprises and turns of events that you could not have predicted. Look back over your life. Just think back. Don't take a whole lot of time, but think about when you first heard of Jesus and you signed on as a follower and you were baptized, you promised to follow him. Um, has everything gone exactly the way you figured it would? Uh, a life of following Christ is the most th thrilling adventure a human being can have. The most fulfilling trip you can possibly take. But it's a trip that's filled with surprises and going around corners and discovering things you'd have never expected, things that blow your mind, sometimes very good things that almost seem too good to be true, other times bad things that at the time at least seem too bad to be true. And so these first disciples, one more verse I want you to read with me. Matthew 28, describing their experience when they encountered him another time after his resurrection. Matthew 28, verse 16 and 17. <clears throat> then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. 
So they're, they're being obedient. He'd sent word, by the way, through Mary Magdalene, tell my disciples to meet me on a mountain in Galilee. But get this part, verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. They saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Now, Matthew was writing a book telling you all the truths that Jesus taught, recording all the marvelous, miraculous things that Jesus did. And as Luke said, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But for Matthew, at the very end of the book, after the resurrection, why not leave that out? That's kind of bad advertising. Some, when they saw him, they worshiped, but some of them doubt, doubted. Uh, why wouldn't Matthew just leave that part out? Here's the reason. Because Matthew was telling it like it really was. Because the way it really was is the way it still is. And the way it is is that though in churches all across the country this morning, around the world, a lot of people are gathered worshiping. But in every group, some doubt, not because they want to, not because they're against Christ, but because there are certain things that just don't make sense to them. These disciples at first, they worship, but some doubt it. They just weren't sure what to make of this. They just couldn't quite buy it. Not yet, not here, not now. And oh, if you're Jesus. Now he's done a whole lot of wonders. He's worked lots of miracles. And you ever thought about this, how strange it is? When he raised Lazarus from the dead, nobody doubted that we know of. When he calmed the raging sea, they, their minds were blown away and they wondered, who is this dude? Because they didn't yet fully know. But get this now, when the ultimate miracle happens, the biggest, the one that really matters the most, some worshiped and some doubted, um, boys, this is the 11 disciples. One's missing and you know why. Boys, this is it now. I don't have anything else in the truck. This is kind of a big deal. But some worshiped and some doubted. Why? Because they were human beings. And here's, here's the thing. Uh, some people, for reasons we don't fully understand, some people find it easier to believe than other people. And that's not a new thing at all. Um, by the way, the, where the, the Greek word where it says some doubted, the word for doubted means stand at a distance. It's not like they were mocking. It's not like they were cynical. It's not like they were trying to discredit what they were seeing. It's like stand at a distance. What, what, what is this? I've got to take this in. I, they were seeing 
the things you've heard about since you were a little bitty kid, they were seeing it and experiencing it for the very first time. Nothing like it had ever happened before. Stood at a distance. Some people find it fairly easy to believe and they're just cut, wired, and conditioned in such a way that they're just, faith is easier for some people. Uh, and if, if you're one of those people, good, good. If you're not one of those people, good. Because whichever kind of person you are, you're not the first and you won't be the last. And whatever your question is, whatever the questions are that trouble you, you are not the first to ask those questions. If you never talk to anybody about them because you're so afraid they'll think bad of you for having questions, you'll probably think, oh, what is, there's something terribly wrong with me. I'm having these thoughts that no other Christian's ever had. Oh, come on now. Some doubted. Others worship him. Billy Graham, remember, y'all, some of y'all who are getting old like I am, remember when Billy Graham used to have a, a column in every major newspaper and people would write in with questions and he'd give them an answer. And I came across one, um, one of those old articles this week and this, 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 this lady wrote in to Dr. Graham and she said, uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, everybody else in my family has an easy time trusting God, but for me, it's just hard. You know what he wrote back? He said, that's exactly what I find to be the case. Bill Graham said, some people have a harder time trusting God. I mean, everybody has trouble. All God's children got troubles with different things. Some people have trouble with their mouth and the stuff that just comes out. Other people have trouble with their attitude, self-defeating attitude, critical attitude. Other people have trouble with substance abuse. I mean, and some people, their thing, they struggle with believing. There was a study done at Harvard University during the last few, over the last few years. The researcher, head researcher, Joshua Green, he, he, he pointed out that um, there's a, there's a, when it comes to believing in God, people who, whose minds work mainly by intuition, they sense things, um, they feel things very deeply. Generally speaking, those people with a strong sense of intuition for picking up on nonverbals and unseen things and moods in a room and, and unspoken words. People with intuition, strong intuition, generally, according to this Harvard study, have an easier time believing with faith. Whereas, again, generally speaking, analytical thinkers, uh, people who are put together their minds just are very logical, sequential, methodical. Not always, but often those people who think in terms of equations and this plus this adds up to that, um, those people often have a more difficult time with faith. Um, but however you're wired, all of these are normal human responses and the Bible is a book 
that tells us profound truths about God, it also tells us very profound truths about ourselves by looking at the characters of the Bible, how they thought, and the writer of Hebrews said, all these things happened to them for our examples. And depending on how you're wired, how your mind works, you'll relate to some biblical examples more than others. The main thing is you just need to realize whether faith is easy for you or not, there will be times in your life, there will be times in your life, and if you've lived very long, there have already been times in your life when, when things just look really clear to you. Life made sense, and you felt so good about it. But I bet there's also, there have also been times when things did not make sense. How did I get here? What's coming next? What's coming next? There's times, thank you, when you're going to be confused, times when things are not going to be so clear. And there's times you'll find yourself sort of standing back at a distance, not with some cynical, mocking attitude, but just standing back, scratching your head, not sure how to tell up from down, or what's the right thing to do here? What's the wrong thing? They worship, but some doubted. But you know what's so interesting about the way Jesus responded to that mixed group of disciples whom he knew so well. In this group, he's looking at, they worship, but some doubted, and yet he said the same thing to all 11, both those who immediately got it and immediately believed and those like Thomas who just took a little while for them to get there. You know what he said? To the doubters and the believers, verse 20, he said, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, let that sink in. Of course, he would say that to those who immediately believed. But he doesn't just say it to them. To the doubters, the believers, and the in-betweeners, he said the same thing. Even those of you who don't know it yet, even those of you who can't quite buy it yet, guess what? I'm still with you. Always. I'm with you when you're aware I'm with you. I'm with you when you can sense my presence and life makes sense. I'm also with you when nothing makes sense. I'm with you when you're wondering where I am. I'm with you always. Jesus was not insulted. You've heard me say it before, and you'll hear me say it again. There's a world of difference between honest doubt and mocking insulting, blasphemous doubt. There's all the difference in the world. Those two are almost opposites. Because there really are some people in the world that don't want there to be a God. And maybe um, I, I, I have a friend who told me about a period in his life when he had really 
gotten a long way from the teachings, the good Christian teachings he received as a boy. And for a long period, he was in full-scale rebellion. And he now laughs about that, not, not that he was far, not that he had forsaken those teachings, but here's what he laughs at. He says, during that time, I did not want there to be a God. And yet, it wouldn't go away. God wouldn't go away and wouldn't turn him loose. You know why? Because he's with you always. When you want him there, when you don't want him there. When you believe it, when you doubt it. And so if you, not if, well, for some people it may be an if. If or when, if or when, you find yourself confused. This doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what to believe. Listen, oh please, do not try to repress that. Don't try to deny that or hide that from yourself and certainly not other people. It's like sometimes we're afraid that if I, we're afraid that if I acknowledge my doubt, that's gonna give it power and it's gonna take over and I'll wind up an atheist or something. The exact opposite is more often true. It's when you try to keep going through the motions and like a talking parrot, you parrot in a cage, you keep spouting off the stuff that you don't really believe. Living that kind of lie, that will destroy your faith. Instead of denying it, suppressing it, trying to ignore it, the reality is your growth in faith will come when you face that squarely and walk right through it. Learning as you go. I'm not saying try to do this alone. See, part of seeking and finding means you seek out people who've already worked through these kinds of things. And that brings up the question, how do I know who those people are who've worked through this kind of thing, who've, who've gone through doubts and confusion, they faced it head on, they sought and they found, and now they've got this faith so alive, so authentic, so experiential that nobody could take that from them. Nothing could take that. Uh, there are people even in this room for whom it's really gotten to the point where it's beyond believing, it's, it's lapping over into knowing. Now how are you gonna know who those people are? This is the hard part for a few of us. In order to know who those people are, you're gonna have to get to know some people and you're gonna to have to let them get to know you. And, and you need to come to church just like you did this morning. And you need to come with the right spirit and you need to worship and you need to listen and learn. But you're gonna do more than that, most likely. If you want transformation in any area of your life, you're going to have to build some honest, very open relationships with people who have been where you are. And the only way you're going to meet those people is for you 
to do something that's hard for lots of us, and that is, you gotta go in, you gotta get connected, you gotta go to the supper club that the young adults have, if you're a young adult. You, you, gotta, you gotta take a small group class. Or if nothing else, you gotta ask somebody to go to lunch or to stay after church and talk. And you're gonna find that some people have been where you are. They've already pat made that passage and they know the way through and out and others who won't. But if you really want to find, you're gonna have to seek. Hmm. Mark chapter nine, verse 24. There's a verse that beautifully describes the struggle that goes on within a whole lot of people. Some, at, more, at some points in life, more than other points in life. But there was this father who had a child with an illness that had gone on for years this strange dark spirit controlling him and he was powerless he'd gone to physicians he'd gone to faith healers nothing had worked you know what it's like to try everything and nothing's yet worked it gets to where you start thinking nothing's ever going to work and by the time this man got to Jesus Here's how he saw things. Here's how he truly felt, but he was truly open with Jesus about it. The father child cried out. He didn't slip Jesus a note. He didn't whisper it. He cried out. Other people would have heard, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Whoa, I thought... You either believed or you didn't. You're either over there on those that always believe and, or you're over there with those who do nothing but doubt. A lot of people have a tug of war in them between the belief and the doubt, just like others have a tug of war in them between hate and love between receiving, accepting people on one hand and just wanting to criticize and reject people on the other hand. We've all got varieties of different tug of wars. And you're probably not going to win any of those on your own. What was it Jesus said? Apart from me, you can do nothing. But the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And where does Christ live? How do you access Christ? You get in a spaceship and go to some black hole where he's hidden away in heaven someplace? No. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and so is every other believer. And some of those people, some of those believers have so many blocks. They've got so much bitterness, so much anger, so much unresolved grief. So much suppressed feelings and doubts that though Christ is in them, there's not much glory coming out because the pipes are stopped up with gunk. Don't allow those blocks to just keep remaining in you. It's not just hurting you. It's not just depriving you of joy and peace and love and a living, authentic faith. It's bad. It'd be bad enough and sad enough if it only deprived you, but 
You see, if you allow blocks in your life that block the flow of the Spirit that's in you from coming out to others, there are people who really needed you and still need you, but they can't access anything through you. That's why your growth, your health, your spiritual health and wholeness is much bigger than just your own business. That's big. I'm saying this mainly because when you start seeking people in a church, any church, people at work whom you know are followers of Christ, you're struggling with some issue of faith, you're looking to them for help, I want to go ahead and tell you, some of them will be able to help you and some of them will not. The one you don't need to spend any time with at all is the one who's got everything figured out, who thinks everybody with a different interpretation is a foolish imbecile or a heretic or something, that person is not going to be able to help you. You want the person who's been hurt, who's been down and is now up. You want the person who has struggled and overcome. The person who's been through the low valley of doubt and come out the other side. That's your man. That's your woman. Seek them until you find them. One more verse. 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. Keep in mind, Jesus is looking at 11 men through whom he's going to change the world. And at this point, they're getting it. They're worshiping, but some of them are still doubting. And yet to this group, this mixed group, he says these words, go and make disciples of all the nations. I'm entrusting this to you. With your mixtures of faith and doubt, Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples. You know, a disciple is kind of a word we've heard so much, we, we don't really think about what it means. A disciple just means student. And what's a student? A student is somebody who doesn't know everything yet. A student is a learner. A student is a person in process. A student is a person who's growing and a lot of people, I'm looking at a lot of people who are growing. You're looking at a student here who is growing. I'm not yet where I'm gonna be, but I've come a long way from where I was. And I'm gonna keep going. And so are you. And you as a student, you, you remember in school, you can learn a lot from other students. How do I wrap this up? Um, I'll say it this way. Jesus was not waiting on those 11 students to have a perfect, ironclad understanding, faith before he began to work through them. Because the way it really works when you're a student of Jesus Christ is two things are happening at once. He's working in you and because he's working in you, he's able to work through you. The people that can help you are the people who realize they are works in progress. 
Jesus Christ is working in them. And though they don't know everything, they know some things. They know, they know. And that's what comes out of them. Seek them out. Whoever you are, whatever your faith struggles or life struggles, current situation may be, listen. He is with you always. That means already. That means right now. And all that really needs to happen. It's a big thing, but it's a really simple thing. Whatever those things are that are blocking, that are stopping the flow of what God is doing, those need to be removed. And as they are removed, the water of life will flow freely through you to others.